Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Criterion Collectors. I'm your co-host, Tim Rosenberger. And I'm your co-host, Rosalie Lewis. And today we're going to be looking at some Criterion documentaries. Uh, more specifically, we're going to be looking at a set that uh, Criterion released called the uh, it's the Les Blank Always for Pleasure set. Les Blank was a documentarian um, who was born in 1935 and died of bladder cancer in 2013. He's best known for uh, documentaries on kind of American folk music, which can include bluegrass, gospel, blues, Cajun music, and various other things. He explored uh, st- topics that weren't just about music as well, like food and society. Um, and when he did talk about music, he usually focused on the music was included there, but he the focus was more society and place that the music and conditions that the music sprang up from. And uh, the documentaries seem to mostly focus on kind of the corners of society that people don't really talk about and the corners of mostly the United States that are kind of um, untread territory for documentarians. His style was very, uh, at least for the ones that we're going to be talking about today, is very objective and kind of uh, very fly on the wall perspective. The set includes primarily 14 documentaries and then uh, I think uh, five or so other kind of bonus documentaries. We're going to be focusing on just five of those today. They are all pretty short. The ones we're talking about are all less than 50 minutes, so they're just short documentaries. Before we get into that, Rosalie, um, do you watch uh, documentaries often? I do. I do love documentaries. I remember in college, one of my favorite things to do was just go to the college library and get like a stack of documentaries because I could rent those for free from the college library and just watch them all. And I've, you know, I've come to really love them, um, whether it's, you know, telling a story of a particular event or person or, you know, the music documentaries, um, I think especially of Jonathan Demme's, you know, Stop Making Sense with Talking Heads, where it's like a concert documentary. And I also love the slice of life type of stuff where we see that here in Les Blank. So, this was definitely more like the cinema verite where you don't really see a lot of editorializing. It's really just, let's turn the camera on, capture something really interesting. And then of course in the editing, you know, you kind of see him bring it all together and tell a bigger story. So um, yeah, that's my background on documentaries. What about you? Do you have any favorites, anything that you specifically look for in a documentary? Um, nothing I particularly look for. I mean, I do tend to, just because that's mainly what I've watched so far, I've tended to um, lean towards the more traditional type of documentaries that you'd see on, like, PBS and stuff. That's probably the stuff, that type of stuff, or Ken Burnsy type documentaries are probably the things I'm more used to. But, you know, I've seen stuff in uh, other styles, too. You know, I tend to skew towards movie documentaries for obvious reasons, but documentaries about other subjects, too, or can be very interesting. And like movies, lately I've been more interested in documentaries about different, you know, cultures and things that I'm unfamiliar with and that are very different from my upbringing. So the set was a uh, kind of a nice, kind of fell nice into that kind of groove of, of stuff that I'm kind of unfamiliar with and societies I'm not familiar with, which was nice. Have you watched many of the uh, Criterion documentaries um, that uh, Criterion has highlighted? There's a lot to choose from, so I really only scratched the surface a little bit, but I have watched some and there's a lot more that are on my to be watched list, particularly anything directed by the Maisels brothers, because they obviously are, are well-known documentary documentarians. I've seen Grey Gardens, which is just one of those things where you feel like, how did they find these people who are so interesting and so strange and are so willing to go on camera? There's another one that they've made that I really want to see called Salesman, which is about Bible salesmen that I've heard good things about. So that's definitely on my list. And then I like some of the other stuff that I found on the channel as well. I don't actually know if this one's gotten a full Criterion release, but it's been on the channel, is a uh, camera person by Kirsten Johnson and she's a documentarian who's shot a lot of you know sports events and um, various projects and she basically took a ton of clips that normally wouldn't have made it into a full-length documentary on one particular subject and almost made it like a an autobiographical look at the type of work that she does um, so that's another one that I really recommend the, it's about that, I'm sorry I'm just interrupt for a second they do have there is a criterion uh, physical release for that Okay, I may end up having to pick that up because I really enjoyed it. It's super different from anything else I've seen because it takes these very like quotidian little pieces of of life and pieces of things she's captured. Uh, But the way it's all edited together really makes it into a cohesive narrative. And it's kind of like a meta 
look at what it means to be a documentary filmmaker. So yeah, that kind of stuff where it's a little bit experimental, I really like as well. And then, you know, I mean, there's just so many things that if you go on the Criterion channel, you can find, I know right now they're highlighting some of the Olympic films, which during a year when we can't have any real major sporting events due to COVID is um, certainly something that could be enjoyable as a bit of a respite from what we're dealing with now. Had you um, watched any Les Blank films or even heard of him or knew anything about it? So the main thing I knew about Les Blank was that he had recorded the short documentary Werner Herzog Eats His Own Shoe, <laughs> um, which is, you know, a <laughs> famous <laughs> famous documentary and a famous thing about Werner Herzog. So I had seen bits and pieces of that. I don't think I'd watched the full thing. But that was the main thing I knew about Les Plank. I knew he did some short documentaries. I knew that Werner Herzog liked him. And I knew that he had shot a documentary of Werner Herzog eating his own shoe. So other than that, I didn't have a ton of exposure to him. But I was very excited to see that these were like short films because it's a lot less intimidating from a a time perspective to catch up with like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes versus, you know, sitting for a couple hours. So, um, yeah. I was excited to dive into these. What about you? Had you seen any of his work before? I had not. I had come across I, my first exposure to him because I, I had not heard of that uh, Herzog uh, subject film. And um, so my first experience to him, him was just discovering the set on Criterion's website, just kind of going through their stuff and finding that. And it looked the the subjects he was doing seemed interesting. His point of view seemed kind of up my alley. So um, it was one of the things I was thinking of getting for the uh, Criterion sale, um, which I might still get at some point. I don't know. We'll have to see. Get up in the morning. Turn around and I lay just back down. I get up in the morning. Pull light and turn around and lay back down. The first one is called The Blues Accordin' to Lydon Hopkins. Um, it is a 1968 film, uh, which was uh, filmed, I think, around 1967 or so, so mid-late 1960s. Um, it is 31 minutes long, so again, very short. It is one of his early, uh, Les Blank's earliest films. And um, the plot is very simple, um, so simple, I'm just going to go off of the standard uh, summary for it that I found online. Um, it is about the great Texas bluesman, Lighten Hopkins, obviously not his real first name. Uh, mm-hmm. The film includes uh, interviews and performances by Hopkins. And um, it takes obviously takes place in Texas, and besides the music is highlighting, like I said, is kind of highlighting the society that the blues came from, or at least the blues came from for Hopkins. And it's kind of, you see a lot of footage of the African-American community in this little area of Texas that we're in, uh, along with hearing a lot of blues music from Hopkins, and you hear him talk a little bit about his perspective on the blues. You know, the blues is something that uh, it's hard to get acquainted with. It's just like death. Now, I'll tell you about the blues. Now, the blues dwell with you every day and everywhere. See, you can have the blues about that you broke. You have the blues about your girl is gone. The blues come so many different ways until it's kind of hard to explain. But once never that you get a sad feeling, you can tell the whole round world you got nothing but the blues. Coming out of this, what did you kind of think of this one? I thought this was a really interesting slice of life. I had heard Light and Hopkins music before, Mm -hmm. but I didn't really know anything about him. And I was sort of impressed with just the access that an outsider was given to film some of these scenes. So, you know, it seems like, especially during the 60s and especially in the South, America was still quite segregated. Mm -hmm. And Frank is, you know, a white dude who's probably born into more privilege than Lightning and Hopkins from the looks of things. So I was impressed with the fact that they were able to establish that kind of trust. But in doing a little bit of research about the filming of this movie, Les Blank said that basically he had a really hard time convincing Lightning to let them continue shooting after the first day. 
and uh, he had to pay him some money. He bet him in a card game in order to be able to stay there. And um, then they kind of established a rapport. And after that, it was okay. So I think that it's really interesting from a documentary perspective to see how you have to go about breaking down those barriers when you're shooting your subjects. Otherwise, you're not going to come out with a very good film. And this was a great example of that because he's able to get these int- intimate moments, not all of them flattering. I felt like Lightning is kind of a, you know, he's not exactly the most likable character. I felt like he's kind mm. of rough and tumble around the edges. He gets called out by the ladies. He probably drinks a little too much. But he was a very interesting subject. And in the meantime, all around him, you get to see other members of the community hear interesting conversations. There's a great kind of back and forth story with one of Lightning's friends another older black gentleman who's talking about a time that he got arrested basically for just his car being in the ditch because he swerved to avoid hitting a pig. And the way that he tells the story is comical, but it also highlights that ongoing narrative we have in this country about race and about law enforcement and, you know, whether things are really as equitable as they should be. So, you know, telling those kinds of anecdotes, I can imagine back then felt revolutionary to do so on camera for a white man and, you know, continues to be relevant even now unfortunately we have come a long way but not long not far enough so i enjoyed that and i also liked some of the smaller just like visual moments there's a great scene of just little children like walking through the town carrying an umbrella and and coming back with like a raincoat over their head and their friend with them and just these little tiny moments that were captured you know it's very fortuitous but it also shows to me that les blank had been able to be at the right place at the right time and be unobtrusive when he's shooting. Well, he I've heard somebody <laughs> describe him as being very good at capturing moments. Um, mm-hmm. And I agree, he's very good at that. And yeah, he's very good at some, well, however he does it for each person, I'm sure for each documentary it's a bit different and some are easier than others and some might be, yeah, come in and be fine with being filmed and some probably need some coaxing like uh, Hopkins apparently did. But he's he appears to be very good at getting people to relax um, I don't know how long he shoots for, but there's, I would assume at least for a little bit to get people accustomed to cameras and stuff. But even people who I'm sure he's just filming a little bit seem to be very comfortable with him being there, which is good because it obviously helps them to be just be themselves and you get to capture those lives that he's trying to record. One thing that I was a bit bothered by was, because I didn't know anything about Hopkins before going into this, so an issue I had with it was, Okay, I could get that, okay, we're in Texas, he explains that, and here's uh, a black man in Texas, you know, in this kind of blue-collar uh, life and stuff, and obviously he sings the blues and can play the guitar and all this other stuff and is very good at it, but he never actually clearly explains who Hopkins is. Like, I didn't even know that Hopkins was, like, an actual traveling bluesman. Um, mm-hmm. And so I looked him up because the film doesn't really explain that, nor does it explain how prominent of a bluesman he was. And so I felt like that could have maybe used because there's some other films where he'll provide, you know, just a little bit of text over the images mm-hmm. of just here's some context for you. But he doesn't really give you any context for Hopkins. And he just it seems like he just kind of assumes, you know, who he is, which maybe if I watched this originally in the late 1960s, I wouldn't have a problem with it. But it seems like. That's maybe a bit of an issue. Like, if you don't know who Hopkins is, you might be a little lost. Yeah, that was probably my main criticism of this one, is I felt like I wanted more biographical information. I didn't necessarily need it to be, like, a biopic, but I really... I did want a little more context of who he was, how long he's been playing, and to your point, his prominence. Because coming off of that, even probably a few years later, I don't know how many people in the culture were aware of him, but certainly now, this far into the future, (laughs) the film has lasted, there's probably a ton of people that have never heard of him. So yeah, a little bit more info would have been nice, but I think because this is one of his earlier films, he maybe hadn't kind of put that part together yet because it seemed like as we successively watched the next few there started to be a little more context provided mm-hmm. and a few more establishing either, you know, text or uh, conversations that helped you understand who these people were that he was talking to. Yeah. 
What did you think of the music in this movie? I know I like the music quite a bit. There's certainly um, a lot of it in the film. So if you want to kind of get a taste of Hopkins music, you can get that from this. Yeah, and I'm not a huge aficionado of blues music. I like Mm -hmm. what I've heard. But there was something about watching this on one of the hottest days of the year here so far (laughs) uh, that just felt appropriate. Like it has a real summer feel to it. And the way that he sings the blues with such soul, and you can tell he probably hasn't had any formal training, but he just puts his whole, you know, his whole being into the music. And then the way the music is edited over the images, because some of the time we're seeing him play live, but other times we're seeing different scenes kind of cut with his music playing underneath. And I thought the way that that was edited together was really seamless and really, really cool. So I think that's a credit both to Hopkins and to Les Blank for being able to combine music and images in that way. I just keeps it up because the blues is something that the people can't get rid of. Yeah. And if you ever have the blues, remember what I tell you. You'll always hear this in your heart. beginning of the film and at the very end of the film you hear some of Hopkins kind of points of view about blues and what they are what it is and all that and I really enjoyed that but that's pretty much all you get is just you know a paragraph or something at the beginning and then like a paragraph response at the end and the rest of it is pretty much just him it's a, a this him seeing the blues and there's some footage of the community that he lives in so I was I guess I wish there was more well I don't want him to less blank to spell the whole stuff out for you know, for people. Um, I do wish there was just a little bit more discussion of the blues instead of just kind of examples of it, I suppose. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think, again, it's just sort of more Les Blank's style to let the mm-hmm. images and the people speak for themselves versus putting his own sort of spin or editorializing on top mm-hmm. of it. For better or worse, it seems like he's removing himself as a subject and just letting the people that are being filmed kind of talk or not you know yeah and that's i'm i mean i don't necessarily need his point of view on it but maybe just talk to hopkins more about what the blues are to him but at the same time if that's all he had to say I mean, that's all he had to say but and it's partially mm-hmm. just a taste thing but again in retrospect watching more of these films i might like it more kind of getting more in groove with what blank likes to do with his documentaries I heard, I was reading, so there's this great um, piece, again, from Les Blank explaining kind of how he made the movie, and he said that when, one of the times that he asked Lightning, because I guess he asked this question about what the blues mean to him several times, and he said he picked up his guitar and started to sing about a woman named Mary who'd left him. Earlier that evening, his wife had left him after a nasty argument that caused her cousin to attempt to shoot Lightning. While the song was being sung, the cousin was lurking outside the apartment door with a loaded pistol. Lightning also had a large loaded gun stuck down the front of his pants. Hardly a situation in which to delve into an academic and linear exploration of the nature of truth and blues, but I came away feeling I knew a lot more about it than before, but I couldn't exactly put it into words. So that makes me think, like, maybe he tried to get some of this information on camera, but the circumstances were just not allowing for it. That said, I wouldn't seen some of the gunplay and craziness in the movie but maybe he felt like that wasn't a safe to document yeah and he doesn't he's not terribly into i mean while he's talking kind of very peripherally about subjects like racism and maybe poverty and certain you know certain things like that he's not directly talking about it and these films are not filled with terrible conflict they're not like taking on big subjects in a very obvious way at least so they're kind of lightish types of types of films so maybe taking on something as serious as oh somebody wants to blow his he- blow lightning's head off maybe not be <laughs> the best uh the spirit of the film yeah i mean his films seem to be a bit more positive and celebratory than that even though again that might be something interesting maybe it would add to the subject of what he's doing i don't know
So the next of Les Blank's films that we're going to dive into is the shortest one of the ones that we watched for this episode. It's called God Respects Us When We Work But Loves Us When We Dance. And I love that title, first of all. Hmm. Um, Secondly, so it's uh, actually just a really pure just visuals and music. And it's capturing one of the historic love-ins that took place in the 60s. This one happens to be in Los Angeles um, in 1967 on Easter Sunday. So you see a ton of hippies putting flowers in their hair, writing, you know, things with markers on their legs or on their clothing, probably in t- taking in mm-hmm. some substances. It's hard to tell. Listening to music, you see a band playing, although it's not entirely clear whether they're playing the music that we're hearing or not. And, you know, a mix of kids and grown ups and people of all different ages. Uh, just look like they're having a great time and holding hands and dancing. And it's a really joyous kind of movie. And it's it's short, but it definitely leaves the impression that these were people that whether or not they totally changed the world, they seem to be really enjoying the moment that they were in. Um, what did you think of this one? Oh, I thought it was interesting. It was, uh, like you said, it's just pretty much a collection of footage and music. I mean, there's not a word spoken during the entire 20-minute runtime. I'm assuming partially because there would have been too much darn noise to record anybody saying anything. But no, despite the fact that it's not doing that, it's very interesting because we talked about Les Blaine capturing moments, and he's really capturing little moments, but also just a moment in history very well of this movement and this type of uh, event. And one of the things I liked about it was the fact that he's capturing so many different aspects of, I think, hippie culture and these types of events too. You see a lot of different activities that they're doing. And just, again, you're getting just a little bit of a taste of the different things that they would have done at these events and in just in the hippie movement in general. So just the fact that he was able to capture all that stuff and to do it so succinctly and well without, again, any words being spoken, I think is just kind of amazing. (laughs) It was funny. I was looking on Letterboxd to see what, you know, other people thought about this Mm -hmm. one. And one person just says... If you like hippies, you'll like this. If you hate hippies, you'll like this. I saw that too. It's true because it's hard to judge people that look like they're just having such a a moment of ecstasy and joy and unity. And while watching it during COVID made me think like social distancing. I know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was just it's just cool to see like this many people coming together for a cause and living in the moment. And it's just beautifully captured. Some of the images are just sort of hypnotic and rhythmic and the way that I think he got even better with this one at editing sound to image because you see a lot of people dancing and it looks like they're dancing to the music we're hearing. But again, I don't think that it was like recorded live because the quality of the music sounds better than a live recording. So it was really cool, especially as someone who obviously, you know, I was born in 81. I didn't live through the 60s, but it's cool to kind of see this, you know, step back into time. We see a lot of movies that try to recreate what the 60s were like. And I'm sure to some extent they're not always accurate, but this is a real, you know, person on the ground view of what was going on then. And I think that was a really great way to just see what was happening. I mean, if you want to know more about California and the world at that time, you can read plenty of things. I mean, you can read, you know, Slouching Towards Bethlehem by Joan Didion or read anything that was written kind of concurrently with this. But if you just want to see it for yourself, this really captures that moment well, I think. Yeah, he's good at, Les Blank is really great at capturing people as being people. He doesn't, he's not capturing them as a uh, historical period. He's just showing them as everyday people. And, And the ones that we've we're focusing on today at least he does that nowhere better than i think this one where he just gets past all of the period mumbo jumbo and just shows them as who they are and it felt like even though it's very obviously the 60s it felt like people that i could go out and meet right now so it felt very present despite the fact that it's you know obviously something filmed in the mid late 60s yeah and i was also just impressed with you know the so many different styles of (laughs) <laughs> hair and clothing hmm. and probably stuff that people made themselves and you know nobody looks like they're wearing a costume they all just look like they're being as close to their authentic self as they can be and coming out of what would would have been the 50s when they were born where it was more like this is how America looks and that almost like Pleasantville 
kind of narrative that we have of that time period of it being really kind of structured to see them really go all the way in the other direction and just be so free was really refreshing. And I can imagine why this movement took hold when I see stuff like this. Okay, so the next uh, documentary short we're going to be looking at is called Spend It All. Um, It was a 1971 film, again, filmed, I think, around 1970 in uh, Louisiana. And it focuses on uh, the Cajun community in Louisiana and uh, focuses on the food, the music, and just the the whole community there. And uh, this is probably my favorite of the uh, ones we're talking about. It was one of the ones when I was looking up the set that seemed the most interesting. He talks about, I think, Cajun stuff or similar stuff, I think, in more than one documentary. And uh, this one, uh, I think, really captures it well. And just the better than Lightning Hopkins, it, it, folk, it, it really captures that community that we're, we're seeing well, and we get more of an explanation of, you know, people and their life views, and I mean, obviously the types of food that they're, you know, eating, and the music they like, and all the stuff, and what his life is like there, and we also, there's this great interview near the end of the short, which is around, I think, 30, 40 minutes, with a guy who I think uh, his main business is, I think he might do some farm and stuff too, but he mainly, I think, does uh, runs a music repair shop. We see him fixing up an accordion. I don't know if he just fixes those, but um, he talks about how life is so free there and he can work as long as he wants and he loves his job and he's willing to do long hours because he loves his job. And, you know, you're free. It's a feeling of freedom. And I don't have to tell you what that is. Have you been in jail? You know what it means. Been in jail for 24 hours. And, brother, that was the worst 24 hours I think of my life. Well, I think I'd feel the same way if I had to live in a place like New York. I think I'd just shrivel up and die, you know. That rat race? Never. If somebody told me right now that I had to move to New York City in the heart of the city, you know, and live in an apartment house or something, if I had to go to work every morning dressed in a tie and a white shirt and being well shaved and my hair is combed exactly right and my shoes are well tied and a bunch of bullshit like that, I say, well, go ahead and lock me up in jail because it all means the same to me. Just really captures their point, his point of view, and I'm sure the point of view of a lot of those people there, really well, which just seems very just free, will, willing, and focused on fun and stuff. Yeah, this was absolutely my favorite of all the ones that we watched. First of all, I love anything related to Louisiana. I feel uh-huh. like I've been there many times, New Orleans in particular, but I've spent a little bit of time kind of exploring the outskirts and some of the Cajun country in the Bayou. And I definitely have a special place in my heart for that place. So to see a short film that's focused on that culture and those people, especially captured at a time, you know, in the 60s, which we'll never see again, it's it's such a unique way of life. And I think it's something so far removed from what the average American is aware of. So this one I liked because it gave a little bit of history of what the Cajun people Their background is where they came from. So they came from Nova Scotia. They were part of Acadia, which, of course, got shortened to Cajun over time. And they speak sort of a a mixture of of French and English that is its own special dialect. And um, it takes a little getting used to with your ears (laughs) to try to understand what they're saying. I still say, you know, I probably would have put on closed captions um, to try to understand all of it. But I liked hearing them talk. It's just a, I don't know, it's a, a unique a unique lifestyle and to your point that man that um they interview with the the music store you know him talking about how if he had to have a normal job in life in new york it would feel like jail to him i was really taken by that because you think about people that live in new york and they're always probably thinking like oh if only i could live you know something a little bit simpler or you know i don't know i think we always kind of look to what other people have and make comparisons to ourselves but here's a person who's really content even though their life is very simple and they don't necessarily have all the accoutrements of of every other quote-unquote american dream lifestyle so i really enjoyed it 
there seems to be this running theme in Les Blank films, at least in this particular set of, and it's kind of interesting considering these are, you know, films made in the late 60s, early 70s that we're focusing on that people thinking that life is moving too fast and stuff, which is partially, I think, because we're t- focusing on people that are living in the country and stuff like that. So that's their particular point of view. And you know, how far kind of culture is changing, how people are moving away from the old ways and stuff. And, um, I mean, especially now with how fast culture moves and, you know, with the internet and iPhones and all that stuff, it'd be interesting to see, you know, how these people would react now to how fast culture is moving. We've lost a lot of the old Cajun traditional way of living because I can remember when I was a small boy, like if somebody wanted to build a house or build a fence or build a barn or anything like that, well, the whole neighborhood would get together and, and just pitch in and, well, this was a job because he was a neighbor and, and you just had to help him, you know? And as the years went, it started getting more modern and better yourself in life and you do that by the mighty green dollar and you got to run at it to get it, you know? So, therefore, we're losing a lot of the uh, Cajun way of helping one another. Of course, I think we're still fortunate to have the feeling uh, towards one another as brothers, whether you've known each other or not. But at the same time, you know, some of these films, I almost wish, I mean, Les Blank was still alive so we could see maybe updates on these communities because I'm really, watching some of these, I'm really curious, like, where are they now? And, Mm -hmm. you know, where where is this Cajun community now? Where is the communities that we've yet to talk about where are they and you know are they suffering a lot are they like certain communities and certain ethnicities or whatever that are kind of suffering because they're kind of you know like people talk about all the time how you know the native american culture is dying because of you know the situations they've been put into so where are these other communities too are they still doing well or are they kind of on the brink of being kind of lost to history so this certainly piqued my interest in cajun stuff and made me want to go to New Orleans and Louisiana even more. Yeah, it's awesome. I really loved, too, the music in this film and the way that they describe it. You know, they talk about how no two fiddle players play the tune the exact same way because they don't play by notes, they play by ear. They all taught themselves kind of how to play. And they also they also talk about how, you know, when a Cajun hollers in the middle of a song, it could be because they're upset and angry or it could be because they're really happy. You never really know. But I <laughs> love just that authenticity of this is music that's coming from the least pretentious place possible. It's just them organically, you know, playing instruments and singing about their life and the things that make them happy. And, you know, it's almost like a, an oral tradition that's been passed down through generations culturally and so you see like three generations of people up there playing you know their fiddles and their guitars and their accordions and making this great music that i wish i could see live it just really Mm -hmm. brings that whole scene to life um and then there's one scene in this movie that we absolutely have to talk about and i'm sure anybody that has seen it will remember forever do you know which scene i'm talking about Possibly. There's one I was going to mention, but what's the one you're thinking of? (laughs) Mine has to do with dentistry. Oh, yeah, that was the one I was thinking of, too, yeah. All right, so um, there's this old man who's sitting there enjoying the music of the picnic, and all of a sudden you see him take a, a pair of pliers and pull a tooth out of his mouth and then just, you know, spit and move on. And, you know, he's like, oh, I feel much better now and there's more room in my mouth. And everybody is just looking on like, yep, this is normal. Well, there, to, to be fair, there is at least one woman who says, basically, like, it's kind of shocked that he just pulled the darn tooth out. But So I think there's some sort of reference to, but, you know, this being a bit odd thing to do. But, yeah, most people are just kind of, yeah, yeah, he just pulled his tooth out. But, yeah, at first it was like... I thought he was maybe eating something or doing whatever, and then he started, like, pulling on whatever it was. I noticed, I figured out that it was pliers, and I was like, is he pulling on one of his teeth? And then he just pulls the darn thing out, and, yeah, it was definitely something, uh, not something you're going to see in uh, other things. So, uh, but I think that mixes well with what they're doing, because it's just, it's such a simple lifestyle, it seems, and, you know, after he pulls the tooth out, he just goes right back to having fun, which seems to be their focus. Yeah, he says, okay, pass me a beer, and they pass him a beer, and he's good to go. It kind of shows how, in a way, closed off this community is from the rest of the world because they're so self-contained that they are doing their own dental work, and it might be because 
They didn't have access to a lot of doctors when they were younger. They probably don't have a lot of money for it, but they also don't really see a use for things outside of their immediate realm. And so they've figured out how to handle things themselves from making their own food to making their own music to doing their own dentistry. I think it's great to see, because we spoke so much when we're doing, when people do movies and documentaries on the kind of turbulent aspects of the 1960s and early 1970s. And just so to see this kind of uh, fun loving side to it too and see what the other corners of, uh, or at least what some of the South was doing in during that time beyond just, you know, the race, you know, the clashes between races and, you know, fighting racism and all that stuff. To kind of see this kind of fun loving side of it is kind of refreshing and, you know, it's just nice to see what other people were doing besides just, you know, the marches and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I found it interesting, too. I think it was earlier in this documentary that they're kind of talking to an older gentleman who's, I'm guessing, probably in his 70s or 80s. And he talks about... Well, I work at 50 cents a day, me. For a long time, and I... Right. But thanks to the, we don't have to work for 50 cents a day, and That's right. I like to see that that time I was work 50 cents, it was yeah. better today. It was a whole lot better what we got today. You think so, Nick? Oh, yeah. Huh? Live too fast now. <laughs> <laughs> and die young. <laughs> Nathan say you gotta live hard. Lo- I mean, live fast, love hard, and you die young. Right. But he said he's gonna live old because he ain't live. He ain't live fast. He ain't loved hardly any at all, and he's gonna live old. And it's just interesting, like the the per- perspective, because things moving too fast still looks really slow from a 2020 perspective in suburban America, but. For him, anything that changed the way that they lived probably felt like a disruption. Ask my captain what time of day. Yes, ask my captain what time of day. He just looked at his watch, man, and he walked away. Wouldn't mind waking Captain from sun to sun. Well, I wouldn't mind waking from sun to sun. If you pay me my money, Captain, when payday comes. So the next one is another one that focuses on a blues guitarist, and this one is called A Well-Spent Life, and it focuses on Mance Lipscomb, who, according to the descriptions I've seen of this movie online, is considered to be the, one of the greatest guitarists of all time. Ironically, I have never heard of him. I don't know about you, Tim, but... I don't um, know. So I don't know where the moniker came from, but he certainly seems like a talented musician. And from what I was reading about the film, Les Blank encountered him when he was shooting the Lightning Hopkins documentary and decided this guy deserves his own sort of uh, separate documentary. So instead of just kind of shoehorning it into the Lightning Hopkins one, he decided to devote his own kind of doc to it um, a few years later. And in contrast to the Lightning Hopkins one, Mance Lipscomb seems like a man who is deeply, you know, devoted and soulful and a little bit less shoot from the hip. And, you know, he talks a lot about the way he loves his wife and he is much more open to just kind of waxing rhapsodic about various topics. So perhaps an easier subject to deal with. Um, but I really enjoyed this one as well and also featured some of the most beautiful imagery, I thought, of all the films. No, yeah, it is very close to, I think, uh, Lightning Hopkins sort of in style. I mean, his in, in the few years, I think this one was, came out in 1971, and the two, three years since the Hopkins one, he's certainly, I think, uh, gotten a bit better, a little better at, uh, let's blank, at documentary filmmaking. But, um, and again, there's a bit more explanation of what Hopkins does, though I just still don't think they give enough context into his blues background. Um, you don't really even know that he, again, he's a, he, he was a traveling musician until partway through the film. Uh, but we do at least get some context of what he does now, which is um, some farming and um, stuff like that. Um, I do like, yeah, you do hear a lot more about him through about his life and about, again, a lot about, you know, love and being married 
and uh, some stuff about music. Um, I think sometimes it could get a bit long in the tooth with what he's saying. Some of the rambling, I think I was not, I got kind of tired of partway through. But like the God Respects one, I think it does a very good job at capturing this community in, I forget this, if this one is in Texas or in, no, I think this one takes place in Texas. Um, does, this, yeah. yeah, this kind of African-American community in Texas, I think it does a very good job of capturing that. And again, the various aspects of it, not just... Uh, we get we see parties we see musical um, celebrations we see um, at one point near the end of the film we see a baptism um, in you know outside in uh, some sort of body of water a lake or something so to see those various things some of which have to do with lightning Hopkins some which don't and to see the various kind of characters that are there like a and I said Hopkins earlier not Hopkins you know what I mean and there was a guy who he, the guy talks about who used to beat his wife and then his wife, got fed up with it and shot him and now the guy is more well behaved and stuff so to see these kind of characters at, along with the culture um, I think just gives you not just a point of view of maybe where this guy came from and where his inspiration for his music came from but where a lot of African Americans were coming from at least in the south was again just wonderful and eye opening and just stimulating I think to see yeah so this one you know it had a little bit more of a cohesive narrative I felt like mm -hmm. and Yes, there's a little more voiceover and a little more, you know, talking from the subject. But I also enjoyed a lot of the anecdotes he shared. And it is mm -hmm. certainly enlightening about that time period. You reference the story he tells and you get to see the man on camera of that neighbor who apparently was horrible and beat his wife. And then she had had enough one day and went out to the field and shot his leg off. And he was better to her ever since. And he said, now she's the boss of the house. <laughs> like... Well, that's an unconventional way of dealing with that situation, but, you know, I guess that's how they worked it out. And then you also see in a much smaller way, a way that his own wife um, kind of got her, I don't know if revenge is the right word, but sort of set things right in her own mind. It shows him eating a meal, and then it shows her, you know, sitting at the couch and eating a meal. And they talk about how, because one night she had made dinner and he didn't come home all night, she'd been waiting for him all night to have dinner together. Ever since then, she vowed to never eat dinner with him. So she sits at the couch and he sits at the table and they eat at their own times. But they seem like a very loving couple who's been together for like 50 years. So it's, you know, it's an interesting dichotomy. But I think this was the first taste in the movies that we were watching of him portraying kind of the gender dynamics that are at play in some of these communities where mm -hmm. the women don't have a lot of agency, but they certainly use the agency they do have to run their households. I, I just thought that this one was really beautifully shot. I think the cinematography in this one in particular really stands out. There's this great scene where the story is being told, but we're seeing it in silhouette and we're just seeing the back of his head wearing the hat while the sun is going down and the colors are just brilliant on the screen. And I, I felt like as I was watching, I was like, I wish I had like a still frame of this. I would totally put it on my wall. Like, it's gorgeous. And how rare is it to capture that kind of imagery in a documentary? I think it really speaks to, you know, the cinematography and the skill of Les Blank to frame an image. And then also, again, going back to the music, I think that some of the music in this film is probably my favorite of all of the films that we watched. And just the quality of the recordings and the way that it's interwoven with the images that we see is really, really beautiful. And one thing I noticed is that on this one, and I think a couple of the others, that he worked with Alan Lomax, or rather with John Lomax, I should say, John and Anna. And they were both relatives of Alan Lomax, who is a famous um, ethnomusicologist. He recorded a lot of field recordings of like folk music, and he's a big archivist that has you know, captured folk music from, I think, mostly primarily America, but also Britain, and put these together in the Library of Congress. So I thought it was interesting that the Lomax has kind of collaborated with Les Blank, it seems, to capture some of these really unique pockets of not only American culture, but American music that could otherwise be lost. Les Blank seems to be very fond of the kind of musical montage, which, I mean, if you watch God Respects, I mean, it's pretty much all a musical montage. Did you uh, like that when he would spend long portions of, well, long, as long as can be in a short documentary, um, but uh, lengthy portions of these films just showing images along with music? Did you think, find that uh, effective in all of these? I did. Um, again, I think it might be something 
that's specific to whatever mood you're in, right? If you're looking for something that has a little more meat on the bone in terms of narrative or structure that might bother you, for me, I found it really relaxing. And I'm somebody that sort of struggles at times with anxiety, and especially in the times we're living in now, I feel like yeah. some movies that have high stakes or even documentaries where it's showing, like, you know, people that have lived in an oppressed situation or poverty, it can add to the anxiety. But in some ways, this felt less anxiety inducing just because of the way it's shot. Now, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. Do you think a documentary should be evoking specific emotions to mirror what its subjects are dealing with? Or should it just be? That's a debate that could be had, certainly. But for me, I liked the way that the music and images work together. In some cases, I like it. In some cases, I don't. Partially, it's a... Uh, if I have issues with it, it's more of a personal thing in terms of, you know, I struggle. I have ADHD, so I, I can struggle with paying attention to things sometimes. And it's kind of like... Um, have you seen have you seen uh, 2001, Space Odyssey? Yes, I have. You know, were there times in that when they were doing long, 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 long sequences of, <laughs> like, a ship of ships docking or whatever with music that you maybe spaced off a little bit? Um, yeah, the first time I watched that, I didn't appreciate it but i feel like over time i've come to really love those sequences although the uh the stargate sequence still kind of throws me a bit but i i enjoy it for what it is so it's kind of in that similar thing where uh he's not doing anything bad you know kubrick wasn't doing anything bad with that film and Les blank isn't doing anything wrong with these films of showing kind of long portions of images with music but sometimes at least for me it can be it can be difficult sometimes to you know, maybe pay attention. It's sometimes a bit easy to kind of drift off a little bit, even though, you know, I'm trying to focus, I can kind of get off of it a little bit. So, I mean, if you're somebody like that who science struggles with paying attention to things, uh, you might have to just put a little bit more focus into these films. But again, uh, not he's not doing anything wrong, and in some cases it works, you know, it can work brilliantly. Yeah, that's understandable. I mean, you could also just put these on in the background, and you'd have you know, a great uh, canvas to, you know, to look at from time to time and to listen to. So even if you ne aren't necessarily paying full attention, I think you could still get something out of it. Okay, so um, our last film we're going to look at is a film called Dry Wood uh, from 1973. Again, kind of focuses on similar-ish sort of stuff um, that Spend It All focused on, though from uh, Spend It All focused most, mostly on kind of the kind of white people in the kind of Cajun community in Louisiana. This focuses on more of a people of color community, but again, it's focused on certain Cajun things and like music and food and festivities and stuff like that but uh takes place kind of in the i guess the louisiana delta like uh, spend it all though i think even more so this doesn't have a particular person it's following like uh well spent life or the blues according to lighten hopkins um it's kind of just following various people the, the community as a whole is the kind of the character of the film so you don't have a particular person you're following you're just kind of seeing these people's lives as they do stuff for mardi gras in a very small town sort of way as they're running their farm as they're you know uh, like harvesting livestock i suppose you know and chasing a chicken around and all this other stuff so uh, you really just get a taste of these people's communities and their kind of lifestyle and again you have people like there's a woman near the end of the film who then talks about and when i was younger i thought it was a great thing to be on earth and be alive and be healthy because you know the meaning of every day what it meant if it was a holiday the family would get together and they'd stick together I used to go to my grandmother she'd cook a big gumbo in a wash pot outside under the trees. She'd hang some meat in front of the fireplace and just brawl it. And all the children was playing one side, the men was outside smoking that pipe, that homemade tobacco, and just talking. The women was cooking, baking, cooking the fireplace and the wooden stove. And we had fun. We'd lay down on the floor everywhere we could find a place and we'd sleep, get up the next day and, and just sit down and talk, talk about life. But now we don't have time to do that no more. You go somewhere, you have the television on, you put a record play on. But now, 
the way the life is too fast. She get together for a holiday or something, they put the women and the children in one place, and the men's leaving, they go drinking and come back. You could never say, well, I'm going to set the table at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock. You can't find half of the family's not there. There's too many cars and too many, it's too fast. If you could bring the old days back, the children of today say old days is past. If I could bring them back, yeah. those I remember, I'd bring them back. Because you, you would enjoy in that time. She's just kind of mournfully looking back at what's being lost in the uh, early mid-70s. So this is the only one that I didn't like. And I will caveat that by saying I'm vegetarian my entire life. Yeah. And, I love and this was a really tough watch if you love animals. Because you yeah. see a lot of not only close-ups of like meat preparation but also you do see them slaughter a pig on camera and i believe the chicken also has a similar demise on camera i was actually sort of looking away at times because i couldn't yeah quite a, stomach it. so i mean this, it is a rough watch and there is some i mean some of it you can kind of well i don't necessarily need to see a pig shot in the head and all that stuff i mean it's a mixed thing i mean from a objective i respect Les Blank that he, I don't know what his point of view was on animals and animal rights and food and all the other stuff, but the fact that he did just stay objective to all this kind of stuff and let the audience make their own kind of assumptions or um, think what they want about what you're seeing, I think it's good that he stayed, just filmed the stuff and kind of left it at that, but some of the stuff I can understand, again, you know, they they're ha- have a farm, they raise livestock, they eat at least some of it, the chickens, I'm assuming, and then, you know, the pigs and stuff, at least some of them. So I understand that, yes, you're going to be killing pigs and killing chickens and then eating them, whatever. I understand that as a point of thing. It's not really my thing, and I've thought many times of being a vegetarian myself. I have not yet gotten to that point, but my issue with it is not necessarily that they're doing that, it's that sometimes they are, they seem to be kind of gleeful about, not necessarily if they're killing the, well, killing the pig to a certain extent. Uh, a lot of that stuff seems to be, they find it fun that they're, you know, the family's all kind of around kind of gleefully when they shoot the pig. Or they're having a game of chasing this poor chicken around and then kind of trolling his neck around to break his neck. And then at one point, the kind of the worst one for me was some of the men are having a party late at night and are drunk and whatever, which is fine. But then they pick on this poor turtle for no other reason than, I don't know, they just have this kind of gleefulness in being very cruel to this poor turtle, which is in great distress. And I think you're a similar thing where they kind of just troll the turtle around by his neck and then I'm assuming kill it. Mm-hmm. And that I had a big problem with. Because the other things are, okay, it's part of having a farm and stuff like that. You kill whatever stuff. But a lot of it seemed to be kind of overly cruel and maybe taking a bit too much joy in killing these animals and instead of just being, okay, let's just snap the neck of the chicken and be done with it. Let's kill the pig in the most humane like, way possible. And instead taking, you know, maybe having a bit too much fun with killing these different uh, animals. And again, with the turtle, which for no reason, I mean, I don't think they're going to eat the turtle. So it just seemed overly cruel to me. Yeah. No, and I mean, I realize, you know, in in a lot of areas, sometimes eating livestock is, of course, part of life, and that's fine. I try not to judge anybody for what they need to do for their living, but, yeah, for me, it was really hard to watch on screen, and there was a lot of animal cruelty. I haven't seen Cannibal Holocaust, but I've I've heard that bad things happen to a turtle in that movie, and I was not expecting it in a nice little criterion documentary so that was a bit of a a shocker for me that said there are certain things that this that i enjoyed there was a really interesting interview i believe it was in this one i'm hopefully not confusing it with one of the others where they ask a guy about the first fiddle that he made and he talks about using a cigarette box and some fishing wire and Mm -hmm. you know putting all these little hodgepodge things together to create his own first instrument that was really interesting um i would have loved to see more about that and you know, I think you're right. Les Blank is trying to capture what life is like here. So he captured all of it, not just the pleasant parts. But I didn't particularly enjoy watching it. No, that, I mean, again, I can, the animal cruelty was really the thing it did. The other stuff was been fine. I think I wouldn't, it wouldn't be my favorite even without that stuff. But it would have been more of a pleasant sit. But the animal cruelty stuff, I mean, the chicken primarily and the chicken and the turtle primarily were just, I mean, when they got past the turtle part, I just kind of left. A bad taste in the mouth for for me anyway for the rest of 
the film, and it was kind of hard for me to kind of not sympathize with these people because it's not really the point, I suppose, but just to kind of get into the kind of celebratory nature of their culture. It's kind of hard to get into when you see them also being overly cruel for no reason. So this was the only one that I was I probably wouldn't watch again. Or if I did, I would skip past the animal cruelty parts because it's just it's too unpleasant to watch. And I mean, I'll say, you know, Spend It All also has a pig roast that you see a little bit of. But they don't like. But you they don't, don't see, the... see it on camera. The the demise of the pig. You kind of see the pig, then it cuts to something else, and then you see them in the process of the butchering, and which isn't great as a vegetarian, but I can live with that. It's a little bit easier than to see the whole process untold. And you're right. Like it does seem like there's an active part of the the whole process is the whole family getting together and kind of celebrating and, and making light of what appears to be animal cruelty. So, you know, I don't fully understand why that would be the case. Um, and I'm surely coming from a position of privilege on that, but it was, yeah, again, like not my favorite thing to watch. But yeah, there's some other stuff. I mean, there's some nice cultural stuff there. You would definitely get another point of view because one thing I did uh, miss and spend it all, while you do certainly see some African-Americans in that film, you don't really get to talk to any of them and you kind of miss on that culture, out on that culture, which they say in Spend It All, you know, that African-Americans, I think even some freed slaves and stuff, kind of gravitated towards that area of Louisiana and according to that documentary anyway, we're kind of welcome there and stuff. So to not see and spend it all more African-Americans talk and uh, be highlighted was a bit of a disappointment. So you get to see more of that in uh, dry wood, which was kind of nice. And, you know, it made me think in some ways, I wished that I had skipped this one and watched some of the other ones that are in this collection. But of course there's no way to know that ahead of time, but Mm -hmm. there's one in particular uh, my boyfriend has seen that he said, I definitely should watch next, so I'm going to add it to the list. And it's Garlic is as good as Ten Mothers, and it's all about the history of garlic in East Bay, California, which sounds like a very interesting subject that I know nothing about. So I'm definitely going to check that out. And then I'm also curious about In Heaven There Is No Beer and Gap Tooth Women. I think all of those sound really interesting. So what about you? Were there any others on this collection that you're kind of looking forward to checking out? Um, I think, uh, again, a lot of the stuff doing with Louisiana seemed interesting. I know the one he did right after this was called Hot Pepper, which I've, which look on Letterboxd, I think a lot of people have said, because I think a lot of people in Letterboxd weren't fond of the dry wood either, seemed to think that Hot Pepper was kind of a sister documentary to dry wood and was a better one done better than dry wood and has, from what I've heard, it kind of, uh, it has a kind of a central character in, let's see, Grammy winning, Creole musician uh, Clifton uh, Chenier. Probably not pronouncing that right. So just focusing on the main uh, person. But that one, uh, the one right after that one called Always for Pleasure, which is what the box says named after. Again, focuses on New Orleans. And um, some of these other ones, I've looked through this once, and uh, probably one of the last ones they did, um, I have on the set, the Sworn to the Drum, which is according to Criterion, is about the impassioned rhythms of Francisco Argubella's Kanga uh, propelled this portrait of the great Afro-Cuban percussionist. Um, so a lot of that's, you know, some music stuff, but then also just the ones that focus particularly on cultures and stuff seem interesting. I had not, I forgot about the garlic one. That one does seem kind of interesting. But yeah, the ones I think primarily about certain cultures or Louisiana uh, pique my interest a lot. And I will look forward to getting towards, and just getting towards uh, documentaries that are later in his career and stuff because so, I mean we focus on ones that are from a very particular time period from the late 60s early 70s so it'd be interesting to see how his stuff evolves and his style and look evolve um, when he gets into the 80s and 90s and beyond yeah and I'd certainly be curious to check out some of his full length documentaries as well the feature length ones mm-hmm. I believe Burden of Dreams is I want to say that's about uh, Herzog and his filming of Fitzcarraldo and then A Poem as a Naked Person is another one that I'm certainly curious about so yeah, this was a great little, you know, tiptoe into the work of Les Blank, and I'm certainly going to check out more of his work. Mm-hmm, me too. And um, we will probably, um, at some point, probably come back to this set and some of these short films. Um, again, there's, well, 14 main ones and then like five or so other bonus ones uh, that we can maybe dip into at some point. Um, it probably won't be for a while. Next time we do documentaries, it'll probably be on different uh, filmmakers, but um, we'll come back to uh, Les Blank uh, eventually. But um, is there a particular documentary that you like or love that you would like to see get the Criterion uh, treatment? Yeah, I would say The Act of Killing would be highest on my list for that. 
Um, and then another one that made me think this deserves criterion treatment also, but it reminded me a little of the style of Les Blank is something that came out in 2018 called Hale County This Morning, This Evening. And it's another one that's just little slices of life. It's directed by Ramel Ross. And I believe, I don't know if it's still streaming on the PBS website, but that's where I first saw it. It was nominated for an Oscar as well for Best Documentary Feature. And it just documents the lives of African-Americans in Hale County, Alabama. Lots of little shorts that are kind of combined into an overall narrative. I think that would be absolutely a perfect candidate for documentary released on Criterion. And then I don't know if you're familiar with The Act of Killing, but that one is probably one of the most disturbing, but also excellent uh, films that I've seen. It came out in 2012. And it's all about the mass killings in Indonesia that took place in the 60s. And they interview the people that actually did them. Um, People who are just living their lives now as if it's no big deal. They never suffered any consequences because this was part of a, a political was, was kind that of the, purge. Is that the thing that the I'm probably I maybe convict you know, I'm getting confused with another kind of uh, mass genocide type thing? But was that what the Killing Fields movie was about? Um, I think so. That? Yeah, I haven't seen Killing Fields, but I know about it. Um, this one I think is a similar subject matter. So yeah, the Indonesian killings, it's from like the mid sixties and it was about the government trying to rid a certain sect of people that they claimed were communists, but many of them really weren't. And it's, it's crazy. Like they have, they have the killers actually on camera talking about how there were methods of killing and demonstrating it. And then they act out a a play of it. And it's, it's really, it's both upsetting and, fascinating and there's a sequel to it that came out in 2014 called the look of silence where one of the people whose parent was killed in this manner confronts the people that killed that person and kind of tries to understand where they came from and make them understand how much of a horrendous thing it is and it's a real interesting reckoning with just the nature of evil and yeah certainly worth worth a look um on a strong stomach but yeah i think both of those would be great releases for Criterion. I'd love to see them get that treatment. Okay, so that about wraps us up for today. Um, Over the next uh, few months, we're going to be talking about, in August, we're going to be focusing on uh, the Coker trilogy, and then um, in September, uh, we're going to be talking about the uh, Andre Gregory and Wallace Shawn uh, collection of three films, and uh, then in October, uh, probably to no one's surprise, we're going to be focusing on some horror films. Um, I think we have narrowed it down to uh, three films in particular, The Island of Lost Souls, Night of the Hunter, and Cat People. And then after that, uh, I won't tell what we're doing for November, but we will be coming up on our uh, one-year anniversary for the podcast, so we're going to be doing some special stuff for that. But we'll get into that more next month. Oh, I will say, before we finish, I almost forgot. Have you actually bought something for the Criterion uh, sale, which might be wrapping up around the time that this uh, comes out? Yeah, so I've made one purchase in person, and I'm planning to do another probably online for the stuff I couldn't find at my local Barnes & Noble. Um, I picked up uh, the Grand Budapest Hotel, as well as Portrait of a Lady on Fire, and then I bought Husbands as a gift for my boyfriend because he's a big fan of that movie and it hasn't been available for quite a long time. So those are the ones I've gotten so far, desperately trying to narrow my list down Hmm. to an affordable amount for the, for the other ones I want to get. But I know you picked up some stuff too. So tell me what you got. Uh, I mentioned the last podcast, I got Criterion's four Harold Lloyd, Harold Lloyd releases, uh, I believe, which are uh, speedy, the kid brother, safety last, and uh, the freshman. Like I said in the last podcast, I'm uh, really haven't seen any Lloyd except for a few clips here and there and documentaries. So um, I'm excited to take a dip into those. Yeah, you're gonna love it. It's great. I love Harold Lloyd. I think I've said this before. So very excited for you. Um, and before we jump off of the the Criterion Collection um, releases. I have to take a brief moment to say I'm super excited for the October releases. I don't know if you've gotten a chance to take a look at those. Oh, yeah. I forgot we didn't do that, did we? No. Yeah. I, so well. here's what's coming up. I'll read them all to you, and then we can kind of talk a little bit about them. But um, we've got Parasite, much anticipated. That's coming out October 27th. Stephen Freer's movie The Hit is going to be coming out on October 20th alongside of The Gunfighter with Gregory Peck. And October 13th, we have Claudine from John Barry, and that one stars James Earl Jones and Diane Carroll. 
And then um, much anticipated for any Jean-Luc Godard fans, Pierre LeFou is finally being re-released on Criterion after being out of print and nearly impossible to find for years. So I'm really excited that that is getting a proper Blu-ray release on October 6th. So uh, tell me, out of those titles, which ones have you seen and which ones are you looking forward to? I may have heard of The Gunfighter at some point. It's hard to tell. Sometimes classic films can kind of run together in my head. But um, the other ones I have, well, I mean, besides the newest one, Parasite, uh, I don't think I had heard of or know much about. The Claudine one seems interesting. I'm very interested in uh, James Earl Jones' earlier work. Um, obviously, he gets kind of, I think, maybe too much focus is on some of his more, you know, obviously Star Wars and some of the stuff he did in the 90s and stuff too. Um, so seeing that film would be, uh, I, I would be interested in that. The John, the John Luke Godard film, I'm not terribly interested in just because um, I'm not the biggest fan of his, just because of, not because of, again, him doing anything wrong, just because of taste. But um, I might check that out at some point. I do want to get into more of his films, but that's not one that terribly excited me. Hits, I know absolutely nothing about. Uh, Parasites, obviously, um, if anybody is listening to this that has listened to any other podcasts I do, um, every year I, dis- uh, I and a friend discuss all the Oscar nominees, so I have uh, put my thoughts on record for Parasite. Definitely a film worth seeing. Um, I will definitely pick that up at some point. Okay, so just some quick maybe highlights from the Criterion channel that you should check out. These are very quick, just a couple things that I would say there is, which is something I would like to kind of go into, um, there's a Shirley Temple movie called uh, Miss Annie Rooney. Uh, it seems to be a slightly later film for her that I would love to get into. There's a um, set, for lack of a better word, uh, from Frances Marion, who was a writer um, during the silent movie days, which I would love to. as various films that she has, she was involved with there, which I would like to get into. And also, speaking of the Olympic set that Criterion had done, I think at least some of, I don't know if all of it, but at least some of that is available on the Criterion now as we record this, as are the Scorsese shorts, which we talked about in one of the previous podcasts. So uh, maybe do check some of those out as well. Um, yeah, and I would like to highlight, um, I think today as we're recording this, it's uh, director Adam Agoyan's birthday, great Canadian filmmaker who has a really unique style and really unique kind of view of the world and right now they're spotlighting some of his movies um i believe the date on the criterion uh, website was sunday july 26th that they were going to be on there but i know they have some of these already so a uh, next of kin exotica the sweet hereafter and some other ones of his certainly worth a watch if you haven't especially exotica is the one that i would most recommend Okay, well, I think that about wraps us up for today. Um, so, again, we already went over the stuff that we're going to be doing uh, over the next few months. So, um, get ex- hopefully get excited about those and uh, check those films out before our discussion so you can kind of join in in that sense. Um, but um, until then, uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Cinema Pack Rat. And you can find me on Twitter at Rosalie Lewis. And uh, you can also find our parent uh, site 25 Years Later at its website at 25yearslatersite.com and its Twitter account, which is at 25YL site. And Rosalie has um, some of her written work, uh, I think, linked on her Twitter, and I have my blog and my YouTube account linked on mine. So I uh, do uh, check that stuff out. Um, but until next time, we'll see you guys later. Bye.